I think our church should absolutely keep dreaming. I think that as long as there's still people to be reached, that we should continue to strive to do all that we can to, to reach those people. There's never an end to it. There's always a need. There's always going to be a need. Um, I, I think we have to reach as far as we can, keep dreaming as much as we can dream, uh, because it's never going to stop. We're going to keep dreaming. We're, We're going, going to, to keep, keep dreaming. dreaming. We're going to keep dreaming. We should always keep dreaming. Everybody, welcome to week one in this six-week small group journey. It's actually coinciding at the same time with the largest vision initiative that we have ever undertaken in the history of our church. We're calling it the Unfinished Initiative. Something that is unfinished has more beauty to be unveiled, more mystery to be uncovered. Something that's unfinished is a restoration work in progress. Sounds a lot like our lives. They are under construction by His grace. They are unfinished. We as His people are an unfinished people. He's still working on us and He's still working in us. We're an unfinished people with a call to fulfill an unfinished task. The task of covering the earth with the glory of God and making sure every person under our influence, every person in this region, has an adequate witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the unfinished mission in our lives, in the life of this church. Now, I believe with all my heart, this journey has the potential to be deeply transformational for you. I believe with all of my heart, this journey has the potential to be a defining history-making moment for North Place Church. That's why I want to ask you to make a commitment right now to be in every one of these weekend experiences when I'll be preaching on the life of Abraham. And then I want, to make, I want to ask you to make a commitment to be in every one of these small groups. We're going deep into a topic every week that is going to be transformational. Our entire journey is going to culminate six weeks in on November the 10th. We're going to do something we haven't done in a long time. We're going to bring all of our services together into one incredible celebration in the Curtis Colwell Center. So just save the date, mark that down. Those of you that have been with us for a while will know there have been some history-making, defining moments at North Place in that arena. It's been a long time since we've been in there, but every time we've gone in there for strategic moments, it's as if God took us as a people from here to there. There was less of us and more of Him, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to go back into that arena on November the 10th and renew our surrender to Him and re-up our commitment to finish the unfinished task in our generation. Now let me just open this small group session with prayer. There's some specific things I believe that God wants to do and let me ask Him to do them. Father, there are people gathered watching this video in coffee shops and in their break rooms at work and living rooms and some in breakout areas at the church. And regardless of wherever they may be right now, what I'm asking you to do is help us hear the divine call to leave an eternal legacy. And I pray you give us practical keys to know how to do that. Change us. Change our church. Position us to reach the furthest and make the greatest impact we have ever made. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The most influential person in my life outside of Jesus is probably Abraham. His journey, I've read more books about Abraham, probably spent more time studying the life of Abraham. His journey of legacy, leaving a legacy, his uh, life of trust and, and uh, un uncommon obedience, um, his faith, his honor, surrender, the transformation that took place in his life, all the things about Abraham, those things and a whole lot of others have been key components that have defined my spiritual journey. And I really believe because of that, and because I teach a lot on Abraham, uh, his journey has defined the culture and the DNA of this church. But I don't know that I've ever spent a consistent period of time saying, we're just going to study Abraham's life. I just drop pieces here and there because of his influence in my life. So I, I, I want us to spend some time learning from 
Father Abraham. In this weekend sermon, I focused on the call of Abraham's life. And when I say call, my fear is that somebody's going to hear that word call in our belief system and they're going to hear call to ministry, call to missions, call to be a vocational preacher. That, that, that's, not, that's not what I'm referring to. Abraham's call was a very personal call to relationship. God called out to Abraham and called him into a very deep personal and intimate encounter with Him. And I believe it's the same call that many of us have heard and responded to. It was a, I said this weekend, a powerful call, a radical call, a very personal call. I talked about the difference between the Christian life being an adventure and a quest. I never really thought about it until I was preparing for this message, but and I'm not going to go all back into it, but I really would like to bring it back up in this series here tonight because I want you to think about it deeply. Most of us, yeah, sure, in the general sense, the Christian life is a great adventure, but in the technical sense of the word, if you look at it in a literary sense, from an author's perspective, an adventure is something for children's books. A character goes on an adventure, they come back from the adventure, and they just pick up their life where they left it. But in a quest... You don't choose the quest. The quest chooses you. You are the chosen one to fulfill the quest. It's the difference between The Hobbit, if you're a reader, and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. The Hobbit is, a que- uh, is an adventure. The Hobbit goes on an adventure. He comes back, picks up his life until the next adventure. That's the book. But it's a children's story. But a quest is something that you are chosen for And you might die in the process of fulfilling the obligation of the quest. But even if you don't die, you never really come back. And when you do come back, you're a different person. So the same you that left is not the person that comes back. In essence, the Christianity journey is not an adventure. You don't just kind of go out and have a little Christian adventure and then come back and pick up your old life. The Christian journey is is a quest. It chooses you. In the, in the Scriptures, you, the Lord said, I, you didn't choose me, I chose you. He, he's been pursuing you since before you even had the sense to know He wanted a relationship with you. And He chose you for a quest to live your life to make a difference. I, uh, I want you to think about it. You know, this is what I, I regret. I, I wish I could be physically present in every meeting right now. Every, every coffee shop watching this, every um, every living room. I wish I could be in all those places and actually personally lead the groups. Obviously, physically, that I can't do that. I'm limited. That's, this is the next best thing. But if I was hosting your group right now, this is what I would do. I would, I would either make a note and at the end of the video, come back and have this conversation or host, you have the prerogative, whatever works best for your group. You can push pause right now and just kick around this difference between an adventure, how Christianity is more like a quest than it is an adventure. And I would love for you guys to talk about it. You can push pause, talk about it now, or just make a note and come back and in your discussion at the end of the video, come back and just dive deep into that for a few moments in your conversation. This weekend, I focused on the call of Abraham, but in this session of the small group, I really want to focus on the legacy of Abraham. The the topic this weekend was the divine call to leave an eternal impact. So the weekend sermon was more about the call. The small group session is more about the legacy. You've probably heard me use the phrase at church over and over again. If you've hung out with me, you've heard me preach, you've heard me use the phrase, more and better disciples. More and better disciples. That's the eternal legacy that God has called every Christian to leave. That's the eternal mandate that God has given every local church. Go make more and better disciples. That, that, that's the heart of Jesus. That's the, that's what he, that was His parting command, His parting words before He left this earth. We call it the Great Commission. It's in Matthew 28, 19. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. He was commanding us to leave a legacy of eternal impact on as many people as possible before we leave this earth. In other words, there is no greater legacy to leave than living your life in a way that will make more and better disciples in your day and then after you are gone. Now, 
Here's the danger with me having any conversation about legacy. The majority of the population, when they hear the word legacy, they see themselves as a recipient. They automatically start thinking about the kind of legacy they receive. So what they inherited, what they, what they get, that, what, what do I get for a legacy, instead of seeing themselves as someone with an obligation to leave a legacy. I almost didn't want to talk about legacy because my fear is we would go to the recipient of the legacy instead of a person with the responsibility to leave a legacy. I don't care if you're 16 years old and you're watching this. Sure, it's easy for an 80-year-old that's watching this to be thinking about their legacy. There is less life left in front of them. But I'm challenging all of us, regardless of how young or old we may be, to begin calibrating our lives around the concept of legacy. When most of us think about legacy in our culture, we think about a philanthropist. We've seen the buildings that are named after people, a library, a museum, a hospital. Some wealthy individual, a philanthropist, has donated enough money to that building that they've had their name etched in concrete. For those of you that are local, you you understand the Perot Museum is one of those kinds of things. Now, if you're not local, you may say, what's a Perot? Well, it's not what's a Perot, it's who's a Perot. And Ross Perot, part of his life's legacy is the Perot Museum in Dallas. He gave lots of money to make that museum a possibility, and his name is etched. It will forever be remembered. That's a part of Perot's legacy. I had a unique situation right after Haley and I got married. Haley comes from a blue-collar family. Her dad is probably the real, the, as real a cowboy as you'll ever meet. Made his living as a cowboy, was a professional rodeo, or her mom and dad met on the rodeo circuit. Uh, but as he got out of being a cowboy, uh, he always was a cowboy, but as he stopped making his living as a cowboy, he got into construction and built the reputation of being one of the best uh, at dirt work and foundations. And um, he, was, uh, he ran heavy equipment and one day I was in his shop, a large, large track hoe has broken down, and I kind of went in his shop, and we were talking together, and um, he just made the comment. He, he wasn't being derogatory. We were talking about life, but wasn't being derogatory about himself. He just said, Brian, I'm not the kind of man they name buildings after. And I understood what he was saying, but I know what kind of man he is. He doesn't say a lot of things, but when he speaks, you better listen because what he says has a lot of weight. He's a quiet man, a humble man, a godly man, a hardworking man. And anybody that knows him loves him. I mean, he became a father to me uh, as, a, as a father-in-law. It just made an incredible difference in my life. He raised my wife to be the woman that she is today. And it just, I don't know, I, it grieved me when he said that. I understand there's not a lot of dirt workers and track co-operators cowboys that have their name etched in concrete over museums. I know what he was saying, but that never left my mind. Um, years later, here we are, um, many, many years later. I'm, I'm uh, what, 25 years older than I was when I heard that conversation. Uh, and uh, Haley's dad is in his 90s. When we became uh, the leaders of Lonesome Dub Ranch, we, had, we took it over from a family, and there was a rodeo arena at the ranch, and and it has the name of the founder of the ranch on there, which was not relevant to us or what it's a new day. And so we took the sign. The sign needed to be redone anyway. And we're trying to figure out well, what are we going to name the arena after? How, how are we gonna, it's not going to go the former guy. That's not going up. And I just told Haley, I want to name it after your dad. I think this is, I've never forgotten that conversation. There is nobody whose name fits that rodeo arena more than the greatest cowboy I ever met, the, one of the greatest men I've ever met. And I, I, I want his name on that. It wasn't her idea, it was my idea. Well, he was going in for a surgery about that time, and, uh, uh, and it was fragile. Uh, when you start doing heart surgery on 90-something-year-old people, the doctors are very honest with you. We don't know if he's going to live through this. And I told Haley, i got to let him know. I want him to know. you got to tell him that we're going to name the arena after him for some reason if he doesn't make it through this surgery. And so I had somebody, the sign wasn't made and wasn't up, so I had somebody Photoshop his name, Leonard Cass Ledbetter Arena, onto the arena. I mean, you couldn't tell a difference. And, of course, at 90 years old, he doesn't know what Photoshop is. So before he goes into surgery, Haley said, Dad, Brian wanted me to show you this. We wanted you to know that you are the kind of man they name buildings after, and our rodeo arena at the ranch bears your name. I mean, he, he wept 
before he went into surgery. Well, he came out of surgery, um, and he's tough as boot leather. I mean, tough. So four days later, he's back home, and he calls me and says, hey, in a couple days, I'm leaving to come to Texas. I want to see the building with my name on it. Well, I panicked because the sign wasn't made, the building. I mean, this is a 60-foot sign with two-foot letters. This is not an easy task. And so the next day, they, they, they're coming to Texas to see this building, and I photoshopped it. I can't tell him that. So we're working around the clock to get the sign up, and as they're pulling into the ranch, we're putting the last few screws on the sign, and he drives back there, and we put, they get a picture in front of this. I mean, it was one of the proudest days of his life, and it meant a lot to me because it's not a building. Uh, it's the kind of man that he is. It's, it's, it's a legacy, and he fits that moment, that place. Kids' lives are being changed into that arena, and he's been the kind of man that, that I want them to grow up to be like. But leaving the kind of legacy that Abraham shows us is bigger than having your name put on a building. It's what you do that impacts people for eternity. The call of God on Abraham's life and his response to that call is the playbook that we must follow if we want our lives to make an internal impact and leave a lasting legacy. So I want you to look with me to Genesis chapter 12. And let's listen in on God's call to Abraham. He specifically spells out to Abraham what his legacy is supposed to be. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. Now just think about it for a moment in real life terms. Can you imagine coming to breakfast as a part of Abraham's family, and Abraham says to everybody at the table, you know, last night I was praying and the Lord really made something really, I mean, I heard from the God, the God of heaven. And I, He spoke to me to leave our faith, our religion, our family, our culture, our country, and go. And somebody asks, okay, Dad, where are we going? And Abraham says, I don't know. Well, what did this God tell you? He told me that if I trusted Him enough to go, that He would give me the details later. Now, just put yourself in their shoes for a moment. And host, this would be another good time to either make a note to come back to this at the end. And this question uh, coincides with question one in the Learn Together section of your guide. So, But just make a note to come back to this or pause it right now and ask that question, how would that have impacted you if you'd have been in Abraham's family and he would have come to breakfast that day and said, I've heard from a God. Abraham was an idolater. God interrupted his life. It was so real, so profound, he knew this was a divine being he had heard from and says, I want you to leave everything you know. Trust me, I'm going to make you a father of a great nation. I'll tell you where you're going when you start on the journey. Somewhere down the road, you just got to trust me. How would you have responded to that moment in your life? Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1 and 2. Let me read verse 1 again. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Verse 2. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. Now, did you catch that? You will be a blessing to others. A legacy isn't about you. A legacy is about living your life in a way that you become a blessing to other people. Now verse 3. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. Don't just read that last phrase. Digest it. Process it. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. That's why we call him Father Abraham. Now some of you, you've been in church long enough, you remember that song. Father Abraham had many sons. Do you remember that? Right arm, left arm, turn around, sit down. I think it would be hilarious if all of you that know the song get up and do the song right now in your small group. If you do, get a video or get, at least get some pictures and hashtag it uh, so that we can all see it. You've got to post them on social media. But some of you know that song. That, that's why we call him Father Abraham. Do you realize the three major religions of the world all consider themselves children of Abraham? 
Jews call him Father Abraham. Muslims call him Father Abraham. Christians call him Father Abraham. I mean, that's the majority of the world's population. So in order to understand human civilization, you got to understand this man's story. I mean, life didn't happen to this man. This man happened to life. This is a, this is a big deal. That's why we're taking so much time to study his life. So why do we all call him Father? Well, it has to do with that last phrase of verse 3. All the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you. So how did that happen? Well, follow me. Abraham had a son. His name was Jacob. Jacob had an encounter with God that so deeply transformed his life that God gave him a new name from Jacob, which means deceiver, to Israel, which means house of God. So Israel has 12 sons, and those 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. And out of one of those sons, Judah, comes the Lion of Judah, Jesus. And because Jesus has come from the lineage of Abraham, you and I are sitting here right now, our lives are being eternally transformed because of Jesus. We're not only transformed for eternity, but we're being changed right now in the present. We're studying the Word of God together thousands of years later because we are all a part of Abraham's eternal legacy. Every time somebody gives their heart to Jesus somewhere in the world, God is keeping His promise to Abraham. All the families of the earth are being blessed through Him. Every time someone gives their life to Christ, it is adding to Abraham's eternal legacy. Since long before our kids were even born, we were praying over them. And all of our lives, we have prayed over them, their lives, we've prayed over them that our legacy of faith would live on and be expanded in the lives of our three kids. We believe that's our call as a parent. And it's not just in our parenting. Everything we do, everything we give our time to, everything we give our gifts, talents to, everything we give our finances to are all a part of the legacy that we're leaving. And the older I get, the more I think about how I'm living now is going to impact generations after I'm gone. What am I leaving behind me that is going to live past me? What is going to matter after I'm gone? What is going to make an eternal difference? Your life changes. Everything changes. The way you manage time, the way you manage money, the way you manage your life. Everything changes when your life is calibrated around the end and even more when your life is calibrated around eternity. You will leave a greater legacy when you live with the end in mind. You will leave an even greater legacy when you live with eternity in mind. Do you realize that The platform, not just my platform for ministry, but my platform for life. The platform I live on, the platform I preach on, is all on the shoulders of somebody else. My my grandfather stepped into my life and became the father he didn't have to be. He modeled life for me. My whole life is built on the... It's the platform built on his shoulders. I'm standing taller because I'm standing on his shoulders. As the pastor of this church, when I preach on this platform, I'm standing on the shoulders of every person that has gone before me. And you often hear me talk about Oscar and Lenny Rowland, two people that kept the doors of this church open. When it ran 10 people, 12 people, they wanted to shut the doors. And Oscar kept mowing the yard, kept paying the light bill. When they didn't have a preacher, he wasn't a preacher. He taught the Sunday school, led the worship, and gave the sermon just to keep the doors open. We wouldn't be here today if people like Oscar and Lenny and a host of others that joined them through the years had not given us their shoulders for us to now have a platform to stand on. I don't want my legacy to be about me. Like Abraham, I want my legacy to be about others. My grandpa's legacy was about others. Oscar and Lenny's legacy has been about others. I want to invest my life in the next generation because I want my ceiling to become their floor. Do you understand that? I I want them, because I lived, because I gave, because I served, I want them to be bigger, better, stronger because of the way I lived my life, the choices that I made, how I invested in them. I want my highest reach to be their lowest place. My ceiling becomes their floor. You're somebody that is leaving a spiritual legacy. 
Somebody gave their shoulders for you. And now it's our turn. It's our turn to give our shoulders to somebody else. Leave your legacy to make an eternal difference. Again, host, make a note and come back to this question uh, in the end or pause the video and have this conversation now. It correlates to question three in your study guide. Who are the, some, of, some of the people in your life that gave you their shoulders? Who left you a spiritual legacy? Who are the people? Who is the person responsible for you coming to and growing in Christ? You can do it now or do it later, but talk about it. Do you realize that your prayers are a legacy? Every prayer you pray is a part of the legacy that you leave. Your prayers don't die when you do. Your prayers outlive you and they outlast you. There is no expiration date on prayer. My grandfather died. His prayers for me didn't. In Revelation 5 8, you get this little window into eternity. John the Revelator is writing a vision that Jesus is showing him, and he sees what it looks like in heaven around the throne of God. Some neat things we read in verse 8, but listen to this. And when they took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a heart. And they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. That last phrase, they held gold bowls full, filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Do you realize there's a bowl up there with your name on it? There's a bowl up there with my grandfather's name on it. And my grandfather filled that bowl up. What kind of legacy are you leaving your kids and your grandkids? Fill that bowl up. Your prayers for your children, for our church, for the expansion of the kingdom of God is one of the most significant parts of the eternal legacy that you're leaving. It's the reason why I want you to think deeply about those who have left a spiritual legacy for you. Because if you do, it will stir a deep sense of gratitude in you. And out of that gratitude will come a sense of obligation, a genuine sense of the need to pay it forward to do the same for others. Jesus said in Luke 12, 28, to whom much is given, much is required. We've been entrusted with much and there is a heavenly call on us to invest our lives in others. So what's your legacy going to be? Are you going to spend your whole life amassing wealth and building a name so that at the end of your life somebody can etch your name in concrete? Now, don't get me wrong. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being honored by having your name put on a building. But, but is that it? Is that all we are living life for is to have our name in a building or in a monument somewhere when we die? How about calibrating our lives around eternity like Abraham, letting our lives be God's currency, letting Him spend us however He pleases to bring others into relationship with Him. I was uh, just the other day heard about uh, Cynthia Cruz. Cynthia is one of our uh, children's pastors. She leads the Spanish language children's services and Cynthia was testifying in our staff meeting and you just got to know Cynthia. She's about this tall, and just a bundle of joy. She's always in a good mood. She has her own health battles in and out of the hospital, and yet she's always full of faith, always excited, and she's a bundle of joy for kids. But she was saying years ago, there was this one little boy, every time she was teaching a lesson, he was up running around, and not just distractive, he was destructive. Um, he was would tear up property and actually physically harmed her. He hit her twice, punched her in the face one time. There were, there were actually meetings with pastors where we were telling her, Cynthia, we can deal with this. You, you don't have to put up with that. I mean, you're a, you're a servant here and, and we appreciate your heart, but no one is asking you to be hit in the face by out-of-line kids. And she said, just let's just be patient with him. He's going through a lot Pastor, you, wouldn't, you would never know. I mean, the details of the trauma this kid has been through, let's just give him some time. Let's just give him some space. Fast forward to just a few days ago. That's been eight years ago. Fast forward to just a few days ago. A 15-year-old boy that hadn't been around church a lot um, walks up to Cynthia. He says, 
do you remember me? And Cynthia says, I, I don't. He said, I'm Justin. I, I'm the guy that used to terrorize your children's church services and I, I think I even hit you one time. And she's like, oh, and I think she kind of just kind of like flinched a little bit. Now he's 15. He's way taller than she is. And it's been eight years. She didn't recognize him. And this is what he said. This is what he said. Thank you. Thank you for showing up every weekend. You were the only consistent thing in my life. And I tried to push you away. I expected you to run. I look back. I know what I did to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did to you. As a 15-year-old kid, I want you to know I'm back in church. I'm back in this church. My mom is back in church. We're growing. And I want you to know I'm bringing my friends to church now with me as a 15-year-old kid. And I want more of God. And it's because of you. To every teacher, every children's church worker, every nursery worker, every parking lot attendant, when you're sitting there, kids running around, they're not even getting this. They're not even listening. They are. Even the ones punching you in the face. Sometimes all you got to do is just show up. Just be there. He didn't remember what she said, but he remembered her being there. That, friend, is an eternal legacy that will be a part of Cynthia's eternal story. Every kid whose life is impacted through a 15-year-old Justin that he brings to church is credited to Cynthia's account. A divine call to leave an eternal legacy. That's what all this is about. Abraham lived his life in such a way that his impact is making a ripple effect thousands of years later. The people who stewarded the vision of this church for the last 100 years, the last 50 years, the last 25 years have handed, for me, the last 15. And, and in some ways, I'm handing a legacy to those. I'm, I'm trying to lead this thing in a way to hand it off to people so that my ceiling becomes their floor. That's what this unfinished initiative is all about. Making good on the investment those people have made in our life. We have a divine call to finish what they've started. We have a heavenly mandate. It's in the Bible to cover the earth with the glory of God and make sure every person in our lives, every person in this region under the influence of this church has an adequate witness of who Jesus is because what they decide about Jesus determines where they spend eternity. And we're in an eternity business. We owe it to those who have gone before us, who gave their lives for this unfinished mission. We owe it to them to do everything in our power. Serve radically. Surrender completely. Give extravagantly to finish what they started. I can't do everything, but I have certain gifts. I can do my part to leave a legacy that will make an eternal impact in people's lives. Fifty years from now, if Jesus tarries His coming, if He doesn't return, and most people think He will, but I'm just saying if He doesn't, fifty years from now, somebody's going to be sitting in a small group at some North Place campus somewhere in the world and they're going to be studying the spiritual lineage of our church. And you're going to come up. They're going to be talking about us. Because we were faithful to what was entrusted to us on our leg of the race. We're positioning ourselves now to be a part of their conversation 50 years from now. Abraham's legacy wasn't about him. It wasn't about his name on hospitals or museums or libraries. His legacy was about eternity. And that's what I want. I want to live in a way that leaves a legacy for eternity. Now, I know there's somebody out there that says, well, Pastor, I've seen Abraham's name everywhere. I've seen Abraham's name on Jewish hospitals. I've seen Abraham's name in colleges and museums. I've seen Abraham's name everywhere. Yeah, yeah, but this is, this is the difference. And it's another incredible thing Abraham teaches us. Abraham wasn't seeking that. That's not what he was after. He was simply seeking to be obedient to God. He left without knowing where he was going. He just committed to trust in a God who promised to keep His Word. This is the principle. If you seek blessing, you'll end up empty. If you seek to be a blessing, you'll end up full. God blesses those who commit to be a blessing to others. He said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you 
to bless others. If you seek a blessing, you're going to end up empty. If you live your life to be a blessing for other people, God is always going to be present and you're going to live a full and satisfied life. We have a divine call to live to leave an eternal legacy. It's God's call on your life. It's God's call on North Place Church. And being obedient to that call is what's going to set you apart. It's what's going to set this church apart. It's what's going to make us live one of those Abraham-type, bigger-than-life lives. We have a divine call to leave an eternal legacy for the next generation, for the poor, in the prisons, for the orphan, in the urban centers, in rural communities, around the globe, and among our suburban neighbors. We've always been about leaving a spiritual legacy among the uninvited and the forgotten. It's who we are, it's just what we do. And it's what we're walking out in the next few weeks. We, we're undertaking the largest vision initiative in the history of our church, and God is trying to put us in the place that we need to be, like Abraham. So when God says go, we say yes. I don't have to know the details. Let's go. I want to challenge you. Don't miss a weekend. And don't miss a small group session because God is transforming us, building us, expanding us, and spending us for eternal legacy. I would challenge you to ask, God, what are you calling me to do? How can I finish the unfinished task in my generation? Father, I just pray and the conversations that will happen in the next few moments and before we meet next week, and they walk in to hear the Word in church or sit down in a small group, that you will have done something profound in the depths of our heart. Grow us, change us, mature us. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next week.